I'd like to thank um, the organizers of the, the conference for having me back. I had a knee replacement last year and I had to miss it. So I'm really glad to be here again and thank you. Now I asked to go first because I actually think I'm going to lose this debate and I think Thomas is going to take it in the end. So I thought if I didn't get my word in edgewise, I wouldn't have a chance. These are my disclosures. Um, just as an editorial comment, uh, just a reminder that this disease is really taking over. Uh, there's kind of an epidemic in well-developed countries. And as of uh, about 2015, in the U.S. at least, pancreatic cancer exceeded uh, deaths, exceeded those from breast cancer. And so we're going to see this, uh, unless we change the natural history of this disease, we're going to see this become an increasing health care problem. One of the reasons it might be is that uh, we're all aging more successfully. And cancer is a gift you get with advanced age. Most cancers uh, increase with age. And this just shows you age-specific uh, SEER incidence rates so that by the time you're in your 70s and beyond, you have roughly the ch same chance of uh, acquiring pancreatic cancer as the average population for colon cancer. So just to put that in a little bit of perspective. So I think this is something that we're going to see more and more, and we're going to need to be ready for it. Now, as you know, we tend to test new drugs in very advanced settings. So in the setting of metastatic disease, often uh, after multiple lines of therapy, uh, we're looking for signals that this is prolonging survival. Once we find some advantage, we will move it into an earlier stage of the disease. Now, we often just bypass locally advanced disease and go straight to uh, resectable disease. But remember that every drug that we start testing, our hope is that in the adjuvant, eventually it will get to the adjuvant setting and will increase the cure rate because that really is the, the holy grail for us. So if you look back at, um, well, now this is about 35 years, but let's just take this 30-year window <laughs> of adjuvant therapy. You could do it on one slide because we didn't move the bar very much, and we didn't have very many tools. We had radiation, we had 5-FU, we had gemcitabine, and it really wasn't until SPAC-4, the last item on this table, where we seemed to move the bar somewhat, and that's where we were pushing the uh, best median overall survival up to about 28 months. And that data also is, well, I don't think the median overall survival will change, but um, the strength of that data was, it will really depend on a, a longer follow-up. So, so we were kind of stuck. Um, this is some of the things I think we did learn from all of that, and these are just snapshots of um, survival curves from a variety of these trials. If you look at CONCO 001, I think it's a very important trial because it really establishes the fact that uh, it's the only trial that had observation arm, right? And a simple little drug like gemcitabine, which doesn't do very much in the metastatic setting, actually, look at the tail of the curve, because by the way, that's the only part of the curve that actually matters in an adjuvant setting. Uh, but we, you doubled the overall survival just with a simple drug like gemcitabine. If you look at um, RTOG 9704 and SPAC3, just those two trials, the ones on your left, uh, you'll see that there's not a lot of difference between gemcitabine and optimally administered 5-FU. Um, these weren't designed as non-inferiority trials, but in effect, it shows you that probably both of those have some merit, and it's probably worth building on those in, uh, in the adjuvant setting. And then finally, look at what I sort of put in boxes there. Even with SPAC4, which was arguably a, a, perhaps a better chemotherapy uh, than the others, th th we're, we're losing uh, 25 to 30 percent of the patients in the first year. And that suggests that somehow we aren't um, smart enough to figure out who should go to immediate surgery. 
So these are the lessons from that phase of uh, history. Uh, adjuvant therapy works, that's really clear. Uh, 25 to 30 percent of patients die in the first year, we got to fix that. Uh, gemcitabine and optimally administered 5-FU probably perform uh, similarly. And then gemcitabine plus capecitabine, so a combination, has a better outcome over gemcitabine monotherapy. Now, Eileen showed a uh, earlier version of this slide, which I think we both stole from Phil Phillips. I don't even know. I, I actually acknowledge that on this slide. Um, this, these, we haven't made a lot of progress, but there has been some. And since all those trials were done, obviously, we had the introduction of fulfirinox as a uh, reasonable option for patients with metastatic disease, as well as nabpaclitaxel and gemcitabine. And then, of course, liposomal amine and TCAN for second-line therapy. So we were getting some advances in the setting of metastatic disease, and the, those sort of made sense to start thinking about those in the adjuvant setting. Fulfirinox and gemcitabine and nabpaclitaxel are uh, NCCN Category 1 recommendations for therapy for metastatic disease, and it made every bit of sense to do adjuvant trials with these these regimens. So these are the latest data. You've heard just the, uh, recently the data from the APAC trial. Prodige 24 was, um, oh, I have a typo on that slide, Fulfirinox versus gemcitabine with the best median overall survival of 54.4 54 .4 months. And APAC, of course, did not seem to perform as well with a best median overall survival of 40.6 months. When you look at these overall survival curves, there are several things about them that look a lot better uh, than what we had before. One is that, the, as, as um, Michele just uh, noted, the median survival with gemcitabine monotherapy is now at about 35 months, a little bit less with the APAC trial. Um, that's not because of subsequent treatment. I think that is because of better selection in both of these trials. Both of these trials required, as you heard, a post-operative CT scan to um, identify patients with rapid uh, progressing metastatic disease as well as uh, high CA-99s. So this is a better selected patient population, and of course they, they would benefit too from subsequent therapies as he, he suggested. But this is improvement, and I would argue that, uh, that while I believe Fulfirinox is the gold standard, it is the treatment to beat, I think that for patients who are, uh, cannot tolerate uh, Fulfirinox, it would be okay to give uh, gemcitabine and nabpaclitaxel or gemcitabine and capecitabine. So I think we've got some new lessons. Uh, looks like the median survival with gemcitabine monotherapy is improving, but we have to keep in mind uh, better patient selection uh, and better treatment upon recurrence. I will say for sure that fulfirinox is a gold standard, and for patients who are fit, that's what they should receive in the adjuvant setting. And we've got options for less fit patients. And darn it, we still have to fix that problem of the number of patients that die in the first year. So what are the arguments for immediate surgery uh, followed by therapy? Well, obviously there's no delay. What if the disease is going to be refractory tr to treatment? Could progression then preclude successful resection? If you aren't going to give neoadjuvant therapy, you don't need to actually expose a patient with biliary ductal obstruction to stent placement. And we have seen studies that have shown, as with any invasive intervention, you will have subsequent complications. There are patients, despite our best efforts at imaging, who will have occult a metastatic disease at the time of surgery, or perhaps more locally advanced disease than you expected, but for those with occult metastatic disease, uh, you, you don't know that that exists when you're starting, uh, starting therapy in the neoadjuvant setting. 
and you, you would not be uh, obviously treating those patients with the proper goal, and you may be treating them with, an, uh, with a regimen that is not useful for them. And finally, uh, chemotherapy after surgery could be more effective. In fact, the growth factors that stimulate wound healing probably also stimulate metastatic growth. So how will we deal with that if we're giving all of our therapy in the neoadjuvant setting? And with that, I thank you for your attention. I'll turn it over to Thomas. Thomas.